The management of inhibitors continues to be one of the greatest challenges facing researchers, clinicians, and patients in the hemophilia community. Thankfully, as we kick off 2018, we seem to have taken a giant step forward vis-a-vis -vis the introduction of a new breakthrough, or as some may say, disruptive, medication called Heme Libra, the first and only subcutaneous treatment option for patients of all ages who have severe hemophilia A and inhibitors. But what exactly is this form of non-factor replacement therapy? How does it work? And what should patients and families impacted by hemophilia and inhibitors be thinking and asking their clinicians about? That's what we're here to discuss. Welcome to episode 11, or our Inhibitors and New Therapies episode of the Ask the Expert podcast. I'm your host, Patrick James Lynch, and today's guest is the world-renowned pediatric hematologist and researcher, Dr. Guy Young. For anyone who's unfamiliar, here's a quick definition of inhibitors, courtesy of the World Federation of Hemophilia. Inhibitors are a serious medical problem that can occur when a person with hemophilia has an immune response to treatment with clotting factor concentrates. The immune system defends the body from harmful germs and viruses. Sometimes, in the case of an inhibitor, a person's immune system reacts to proteins and factor concentrates as if they were harmful foreign substances because the body has never seen them before. When this happens, inhibitors, also called antibodies, form in the blood to fight against the foreign factor proteins, and this stops the factor concentrates from being able to fix the bleeding problem. Bleeding is very hard to control in someone with hemophilia who develops inhibitors. A person with inhibitors faces more bleeding and pain because treatment with factor concentrates does not work. In patients with persistent inhibitors, if the bleeding into the muscles and joints is not controlled, permanent damage is likely. For patients with sufficient access to care, treatment of inhibitors is one of the biggest challenges in hemophilia today. It is possible to get rid of inhibitors using a technique called immune tolerance induction or immune tolerance therapy, ITI, ITT. However, this type of treatment requires specialized medical expertise, is expensive, takes a long time, and I will add is not always effective. Drugs called bypassing agents can be used to work around inhibitors and help blood clot. Again, that's courtesy of the World Federation of Hemophilia and their inhibitors working group. Then, just as 2017 was winding to a close, a new medication option for people with severe hemophilia A and inhibitors was approved by the FDA, Heme Libra, the first and currently only subcutaneous medication designed to protect patients with severe hemophilia A and inhibitors from getting bleeds. So we thought this would be a great time to invite hemophilia and inhibitors expert Dr. Guy Young from the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles on to ask the expert to discuss inhibitors, heme libra, and what 2018 has in store for our community. Before we get into today's interview with uh, Dr. Guy Young to talk all about inhibitors and this new product that's available for people with inhibitors, we have a big announcement to make about the future of the Ask the Expert podcast, and that is that um, this will actually be my final episode as the host of the Ask the Expert podcast. I'll still be hosting the Bloodstream podcast, but as we're growing, we're trying to incorporate more people from the bleeding disorders community into roles at Bloodstream Media and have other voices that are help guiding conversations and bringing information to you, the listeners. And we have found a new host for the Ask the Expert podcast. I'm very excited about this host. If you've been listening to the Bloodstream Media podcast for a while, you probably heard from this guy a few times already in various capacities. We, we tend to like working together. Um, but the new host of the Ask the Expert podcast starting in February will be none other than Mr. Chris Bombardier, who joins me right now. Hello, Chris. Hey, Patrick. How's it going? It's going well. How are you? Doing well. Just getting ready to go climb Mount Vincent in Antarctica in a couple of days. <laughs> that's true. By the time they hear this, that'll be in the rearview mirror. But that's that's Chris's commitment already to the Ask the Expert podcast. He's going to climb the seventh summit of his seven summits in just a few days, and he's making time to record this. Um so yeah, and actually let's use that as a, as a kind of a jumping off point. So people may know you as the mountaineer, the mountain climber, climbed Everest, documentaries, climbing mountains all over the place. Um, but give us a little more background about you as not just a person with severe hemophilia B, but your involvement and role in the community over the years. Give us a little more background on who is Chris Bombardier. Yeah, 
so actually in college, um, as a summer job, I got a job in the research lab at the University of Colorado's uh, hemophilia treatment center. I actually went in for a bleed <laughs> and uh, was getting checked out by the physical therapist. And uh, one of the people that worked there was like, hey, do you need a, a summer job? Yeah, uh, we got one in the research <laughs> lab. So <laughs> went in with a bleed, left with a job. Yeah, it was a pretty sweet gig, um, and it was really fun because I was a I was a science major, I was a biology major, um, so I really liked uh, sciences and learning more, you know, just about how things worked. And it was it was a pretty fun job learning more about my hemophilia specifically. Um, so I did that uh, through college every summer, and then after I graduated, I went and started working there full time and. Worked in the lab for, I think it was about five or six years um, full time. Um, and it was really fun to learn the complexities of um, not only like hemophilia, but all of the bleeding disorders out there. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and while I was working in the lab, I got involved in the hemophilia camp here in Colorado. Um, the now executive director of our chapter, Amy Board, um, she's like, Have you ever been to camp? And I was like, Well, once when I was like seven. Um, but, uh, I hadn't been back in a while. It's like, well, we, we, we'd love to have you as like a leadership counselor. And I went back and I fell in love with it, um, in a way that I didn't when I was seven. And I, I saw the, this huge value in camp. And so I started getting involved in that, got really passionate about working in the hemophilia community and, um, went on to create Backpacks and Bleeders, which is a hiking program here in Colorado with a chapter. Um, and now I work for a company called Gut Monkey, um, and we work um, basically doing experience-based education for people with chronic medical conditions, but uh, mainly in uh, hemophilia right now. Um, so that's pretty cool. I'm like, my whole life has gone into this hemophilia world, um, which is great. Um, <laughs> it's been been really awesome experience. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that I thought you, you know, when, when I reached out to you to ask about this, um, given your work in the lab and in science, in the camp environment, and outdoor education, um, the work you do as a board member of Save One Life and your awareness of both the population here in the U.S. and around the globe, I feel like you have a, a lot of different um, intelligences within our community to draw from as a host, um, as someone who is selecting guests and helping identify topics for this podcast. Um, so, so let's talk about the podcast. So what... I know you're a big podcast fan and a consumer of them like I am uh, on like an addictive level, uh, speaking for myself now. Um, so, uh, and I believe that that, you know, adds a lot to what you're able to do as a podcast host. But in, in your own words, how do you see yourself as the Ask the Expert host? How do you, uh, what should people, what should listeners be expecting from the Chris Bombardier hosted Ask the Expert podcast? Well, I am definitely a podcast addict. Um, <laughs> I found uh, I found them a couple years ago when I was actually training, starting training for Everest, and I was in the gym, you know, for hours or hiking for hours, and I needed something to like occupy my brain. Um, and <laughs> somebody suggested podcasts, and I just love how they tell a, a really great story, and you're able to like, you know, keep moving and doing things while you're learning. Um, and and I love, I just love gaining information like that. Um, so I'm really excited about hosting a podcast to try and be able to, you know, present that in, you know, information I'm interested in and that the community might be interested in, in like a fun new, new way, um, you know, that maybe you're, you have a long commute uh, to work every morning and instead of, you know, flipping on news radio or something, which, which isn't always bad, but uh, you can learn something about your community while you're on, you know, on the way. Um, so I'm really excited to, yeah, just be able to share more information with people in, in a cool, fun way. Well, in the meantime, if uh, if anyone listening to this, if you want to check out what Chris has been up to, if you're not um, already connected, find Chris on Facebook, Adventures of a Hemophiliac, Chris Bombardier. And then come February, you'll be hearing his voice right here on the Ask the Expert podcast. And I, for one, am looking very much forward to that, Chris. So thanks for saying yes, and thanks for being the new host of the Ask the Expert podcast. Yeah, thanks a lot, Patrick. I'm looking forward to it. Chris's first episode as the Ask the Expert podcast host will go live on Monday, February 26th. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Ask the Expert podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And hey, as your departing host, I'll ask you one last time, if you haven't already, leave a review of the Ask the Expert podcast on iTunes. It helps more potential listeners find the show. 
And with that, let's now roll into our interview on inhibitors and new therapies with acclaimed pediatric hematologist, Dr. Guy Young. So Dr. Young, pediatric hematologist from uh, UCLA, the Children's Hospital here in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for coming on Ask the Expert today to talk about inhibitors and and new products for inhibitors. Um, Really appreciate your time. Oh, sure. Happy to do it. So uh, there's a lot to get to, but it's impossible to not discuss uh, Hemlibra in in light of it coming out on November 16th. It was officially approved by the FDA, um, approved for... Uh, preventing and reducing the frequency of bleeding episodes in adult and pediatric patients with hemophilia A who have developed antibodies called factor eight inhibitors. That was as of November 16th, 2017. So before we dive into some of the specifics, can you just give us in broad strokes, what does this mean for the hemophilia A with inhibitor community? Well, I think for many years, um, the treatment for inhibitor patients has lagged behind the treatment for non-inhibitor patients. Essentially, non-inhibitor patients, uh, you know, with factor prophylaxis, which which I'm not saying is easy to do, but uh, but with factor prophylaxis, um, most patients can lead a, a pretty normal life uh, with uh, very minimal uh, bleeding events and and able to participate in work, school, and other sorts of activities. Unfortunately, with inhibitor patients, uh, factor prophylaxis, of course, does not work, and bypassing agent prophylaxis. Um, is um, you know marginally effective uh, at best, and so those patients suffer much more significant morbidity, miss a lot of school, may not be able to participate in any kind of work, uh, and suffer a lot more pain as a result of having very bad uh, joint disease due to recurring uh, recurrent joint bleeding. So really, we've needed a better agent to prevent bleeding in patients with hemophilia with inhibitors. Um, Hemlibra is a, an agent that is, uh, as you mentioned, newly uh, licensed and is licensed for patients with hemophilia A, only hemophilia A, with inhibitors, uh, both children and adults, for the prevention of bleeding. The data from the HAVEN-1 study, which is 12 years and older, has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the data from the HAVEN-2 study was recently presented at the American Society of Hematology meeting. HAVEN-2 is a similar study to HAVEN-1, but for children less than 12 years of age. In essence, the results are really quite dramatic with with significant reductions in bleeding, uh, well over 90%. In the pediatric patients, 95% of the patients had no uh, bleeding that required any treatment. And in the adult patients, 65% required no treatment uh, that required, uh, sorry, had no bleeding events that required any sort of treatment. So this is really uh, something uh, quite uh, dramatic uh, with respect to the results and and, uh, is going to be uh, I think widely adopted in hemophilia A patients with inhibitors for the prevention of bleeding, hopefully converting them into a fairly mild phenotype uh, where uh, they have very little to no bleeding, and, and when they do have bleeding, it can be still be managed uh, with bypassing agents. So, you know, we're very careful to speak about how it's used to prevent bleeding and not treat bleeds, um, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but to kind of zoom out of that, can you help us understand what Hemlibra actually is because it's it's not factor, but it works like factor. We can't measure it in pharmacokinetics or PK like we're used to, but there's another data point we can kind of sort of look at for tracking. So just can you help community listeners understand what Hemlibra actually is? So Hemlibra is uh, a bispecific antibody <clears throat> which mimics the function of factor eight. What this means basically is that um, the the function of an antibody is uh, to essentially bind uh, substances that it recognizes. In this case, uh, being a bispecific antibody means that it can bind to two different substances. And what Hemlieber does is it binds factor 9A and factor 10 and brings them into the proper conformation to help uh, generate uh, thrombin, which is the clot-forming protein that we need to have. This is basically the same function, or it is the same function, as factor 8 in that reaction between factor 9 and 10. So Hemlibra is taking the place of factor 8 in that reaction between factor 9 and 10 and helping to generate the clot that hemophilia patients need. Since it is not factor, since it does not look like factor 8 and is not factor 8, Um, it is not recognized by the antibodies or inhibitors that hemophilia patients with inhibitors have and therefore can function in inhibitor patients um, like factor VIII, um, even though it's not factor VIII. And as we know, this was um, this was specifically fast tracked through the FDA because it had a promise to specifically 
enhance the quality of life and, and medical offerings for patients with inhibitors. But I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the expectation is over time and probably sooner than not, there'll be enough data to support um, uh, an application for uh, hemolibra to be able to u be used by people with severe hemophilia A who don't necessarily have inhibitors. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, there is another study called the HAVEN-3 study, um, which is um, essentially completed. Um, Genentech, uh, which is the U.S. company that is licensing the product, put out a press release essentially saying that the HAVEN-3 study met its endpoints, meaning that the results were positive. Um, the full data uh, will be released to the public sometime later, uh, or sometime in 2018. I don't know exactly when. Uh, but yes, the, the idea is that this product can be used in patients with hemophilia A without inhibitors um, <clears throat> because it is, again, uh, mimicking the function of factor VIII. Uh, and so, yes, potentially sometime later in 2018, it may, in fact, be licensed for patients without inhibitors as well. The advantage for patients without inhibitors is that this drug is given subcutaneously once a week, potentially once every two weeks or even once every four weeks. Those dosing schedules are being uh, tested now. Um, and so obviously much, much um, easier to administer uh, than factor with a easier route, subcutaneous, and less frequently uh, than factor needs to be given today. So going back to our inhibitor population specifically, since that's the population for whom this, uh, this product is now available, uh, when a patient with inhibitors who's taking Hemlibra uh, has a breakthrough bleed because while the data is very encouraging, the, the lack of bleeding is extraordinarily encouraging. As we know, just bleeds are a part of life. Things can happen. What does that person do in that case? Yes, you make an important point, which is that while bleed reduction has been very dramatic, particularly in the pediatric age group, um, you know, bleeds still have occurred on the study and uh, surgeries uh, have uh, happened on the study. And of course, traumas can happen and patients may need to get treated for those as well. And so uh, patients with inhibitors on Hemlibra um, are, you know, can receive uh, bypassing agents to treat uh, bleeding events when they happen. Uh, one major caution, which is in the black box warning of the package insert, is that thrombotic events, including something called thrombotic microangiopathy, have occurred in patients receiving Hemlibra and APCC, uh, otherwise known as FIBA. So there seems to be an interaction, not seems to be, I mean, there is an interaction between FIBA and Hemlibra where you may tilt into too much clotting. Uh, and therefore, um, it is probably best to avoid using FIBA, if at all possible, when treating breakthrough bleeding in patients who are on Hemlibra. So the go-to agent basically is going to be Novo7, and patients should use Novo7 at the you know, lowest um, um, prescribed dose or you know the lowest dose that's approved by the Food and Drug Administration, which is 90 to 120 micrograms per kilogram, um, to treat bleeding events, uh, to manage surgery, um, and to deal with uh, traumas. Um, only those events that don't respond to Novo7 uh, can FIBA then be used, but it should be used also at the lowest dose and with extreme caution. So I do advise uh, you know, patients who uh, may go on Hemlibra to familiarize themselves with the package insert, with the black box warning, and most importantly for prescribers, they need to be very aware of this uh, so that we don't have any more of those types of events because those are very serious and potentially uh, life-threatening events if they do happen. So you obviously know this much better than than I do, but it's it's my understanding that patients with inhibitors sometimes they, there's currently basic well prior to Hemlibra we had Novo Seven and and Fiba and these are the options for bypassing agents to help treat those bleeds and manage those patients. Not everyone would respond to both. Sometimes there would it would alternate. Someone may respond to Novo Seven this month and then down the road they don't. Now they're on Fiba. They switch back. I don't know just how prevalent that is, and maybe you can help shine a light on that. Are you at all concerned about the fact that Hemlibra can only be used, it seems like, with one bypassing agent? And even in your description of how that bypassing agent should be used, words like extreme caution and you know the potential for a life-threatening event. Is, on one hand, there's an extraordinary value and promise to what this offers. But on the other hand, there does seem to be a, a bit of a significant watch out. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? 
Yes, certainly. So, uh, first of all, yes, you're correct that in, in the past, well, I mean, even now, uh, generally speaking, uh, patients with hemophilia A and inhibitors uh, often have both bypassing agents at home. I mean, my patients have always had both bypassing agents at home because, you know, they may respond better to one bleed with Novo7, another bleed with FIBA. Some actually use Novo7 for joint bleeds, FIBA for muscle bleeds. There's all kinds of things that have been learned by the patients over many years of using both of those bypassing agents. I think the point of the um, black box warning and the point of how we manage breakthrough bleeding is 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 not that you absolutely can never ever use FIBA. It's that when these serious events happened, they occurred with patients who were using FIBA, uh, patients on Hemlibra using FIBA, but more specifically, these were patients who were receiving more than 100 units per kilogram per day for more than 24 hours. So in other words, mm -hmm. patients who were using uh, quite a bit of FIBA, um, you know, more than, you know, the other patients, shall we say, on the study, uh, those are the patients that got into trouble. Um, there was plenty of bleeding events that were treated with FIBA on these studies, on, you know, with patients on Hemlibra, um, and most, the vast majority of those events treated with FIBA did not result in any problems at all. However, those were patients who got, you know, one, maybe two doses of FIBA, uh, over the course of one day at relatively modest doses of 50 units per kilogram for two doses or maybe just one dose of 75 units per kilogram. So it's not that FIBA must be avoided. It's that um, caution must be used uh, if a bleed seems to require um, you know, prolonged treatment. So generally speaking, you know, the, the recommendations are to try to use Novo7 first. And it could be that even patients before who used FIBA preferentially may respond well to Novo7 with Hemlibra on board. It could be that that just a bit of Novo7 on top of the Hemlibra may be enough to control bleeding events. So the the encouragement um, is to go with Novo7 first, uh, but uh, certainly any bleed that doesn't respond, absolutely FIBA should be given, uh, but at lower doses for less length of period of time. And, and frankly, the bleed should resolve with even you know, one or two modest doses of FIBA based on what we see in the laboratory um, testing. So asking you to step outside a little bit of your role as a hematologist, um, the cost of Hemlibra has been something that's been speculated about for a while since, you know, we've opened up now a whole new class of product. We, we've had plasma-derived factory placement products. We have had recombinant uh, factor products. We're now in a whole, we've had extended half-life products, which still belong to those classes, but we're a bit of an extension, so to speak. But now we're in a whole new bucket. And so there was questions about how is this going to be priced? How do you figure that out? And I've seen estimates in, in the high uh, $400,000 range for the first year, and then thereafter based on weight, which sort of makes sense to me. Do you, for anyone who's hearing this and learning about Hemlieber maybe for the first time or with some depth maybe for the first time, um, what's your understanding about cost and insurance companies and how people can actually on a practical level get their hands around this? Again, I know that's not necessarily something that falls under the purview of a hematologist per se, but I'm, I'm sure you have a little bit of insight on this topic. Yeah, no, certainly. And I, I think, you know, we obviously do understand as hematologists that these drugs cost a lot of money. I mean, factor in general, I mean, treating hemophilia patients does cost a lot of money. And, and insurance is, you know, sometimes a problem. And so, I mean, it is part and parcel of our, our job. It, it's not just my job to write a prescription and then wish the patient luck in getting the prescription. My job is to write the prescription and ensure that the patient gets access to the drug as well. So I think access is, is, is for me, an important, uh, an important uh, issue. Now, having said that, um, yes, uh, the pricing that you quoted is what I've heard as well. And essentially, the way I think it could be thought of is that um, you know, that pricing is based on like a 70 kilogram male using, uh, so, you know, if you take a 70 kilogram average size adult who is using factor eight prophylaxis, and obviously there's 11 factor eights on the market and some are extended half-life and, well, 11 recombinant factor eights. So uh, the point is that, that the pricing of factor eight varies, you know, quite significantly. I mean, there's some that cost, you know, half or a third as much as others. But I mean, without getting, you know, too crazy with the numbers, I think we can basically say, that the cost of Hemlibra for an adult uh, patient is going to be similar to the cost of prophylaxis in a non-inhibitor patient. So let me make a couple points. First off, if we take the average cost per year for an inhibitor patient uh, in the U.S., that's upwards around $1.8 million a year 
of factor uh, bypassing agents. So for the inhibitor patients, this this cost of Hemlieber represents a dramatic uh, cost reduction, actually. I mean, payers, I think, are going to be very pleased uh, at offering Hemlieber to inhibitor patients over, you know, FIBA prophylaxis or Novo7 prophylaxis or even on-demand therapy with those drugs because, you know, based on the average cost across, you know, all the patients, this will represent a dramatic reduction in cost for inhibitor patients. So I think with inhibitor patients, there should be no access issues really whatsoever so long as somebody has a payer, uh, regardless of who the payer is. In the future, um, you know, if when the drug becomes available for non-inhibitor patients, you know, the cost looks like it's going to be about similar to prophylaxis. So, again, um, I don't think that the cost is going to create an access issue for the vast majority um, of patients. Um, so, I, I believe that, that uh, you know, with the licensure of the drug in inhibitor patients, it's not going to be a problem to get it for inhibitor patients um, because of the comments I made about the cost. You know, for non-inhibitor patients, um, I think, yes, it'll depend partly on insurance, partly how much their current factor costs and things like that. But again, I do believe that, you know, access is not going to be a problem. And by and large, when new drugs have come along, including extended half-life factor 8s and factor 9s, you know, in most situations, uh, it's not a problem to get um, access to patients um, once a physician prescribes them. I'm aware that, that clearly there's exceptions to that. But, but by and large, if you have insurance, whether it's public or private, um, getting factor in general is not a problem. Well, it stands to reason, too. Like you said, the cost savings appeal to payers and insurance companies um, should be a dial mover for them. This is a pretty, while the number on its face, you know, half a million dollars may sound expensive um, relative to the cost of treating, as you said, your your average adult inhibitor patient, 1.8 million. Uh, it's obviously a pretty steep decline from that. So one other question just along these lines um, I've heard some people ask questions about, well, if I if I uh, am taking Hemlibra, but then I also do need to keep a stock of a bypassing agent for bleeds, is that going to cause issues with my payer? Are they going to wonder why I need two medications now as opposed to one? But then I've heard other inhibitor patients and families respond to that with, you know, we, we already have two. We, we already have a supply of Novo and a supply of Fiba, I think you said earlier, that many of your patients, that, that is the case. So my my gut check guess is that that won't present any access issues, at least by and large. Of course, you know, there can be one-off or outlier cases. Do you have a different take? Well, I think, you know, still, you know, there is a potential for patients to still have bleeds. And, you know, we don't want them to have to come to the hospital for a bleed. So I believe having, uh, you know, a, a very modest um, amount of bypassing agent at home, you know, say, you know, you know, one to two doses of FIBA, if, if that's the choice that's made, again, with the cautions I said earlier, or, mm -hmm. you know, three or four doses of Novo7 to have at home, and, and, and really preferably to try to get, you know, long-dated factor, which, you know, it's weird because with inhibitor patients, we never thought that was an issue because they're going through the factor <laughs> so much. But, but you know, trying to right. get, you know, factor that's maybe a bit longer dated than, than usual so that um, it either does get used or at least it can sit on the shelf for about a year. But, no, patients definitely should still have you know, emergency supply factor at home. Now, I don't think they need to have, you know, 30 doses of Novo7 available so when a bleed comes along, you know, they can be treating it for four or five days or multiple doses of FIBA. I think just enough to, you know, get some treatment started and then contact, you know, your hematologist or hemophilia treatment center to then decide on the next step of action. I think that makes sense. But to have a lot of that mm -hmm. at home, no, I don't think it's necessary because we see very few bleeding events. Um, and the bleeding events do tend to resolve fairly quickly. Um, so that, that should sort of appease, you know, the payer's issues of having, you know, two drugs at home. Yeah, that makes, that makes plenty of sense. Okay, a couple more questions about Hemlibra, because, again, while, while we're intended to talk about inhibitors today, it's kind of hard to talk about them right now without talking about this brand-new breakthrough paradigm shift of, of medication that's available. Um, you mentioned earlier the importance of prescribing hematologists, prescribing physicians, um, being cognizant of things like the black label warning and, and the dosing amounts and um, some of the minutia or the details, so to speak, of how Hemlibra should be used and especially used in conjunction with another product when there's an active bleed to, um, to bring down, to manage. How do we go about doing that? What what mechanisms do we have in place as a community to make sure that, because you're obviously very heavily involved in, in research and studies and in the inhibitor world in general, 
but that's not necessarily true for every prescribing hematologist. So how do we make sure that that message gets communicated to the greater body of your colleagues? Yeah, so I think that that's, you know, there, there's, there's a huge educational requirement um, here. Number one, with, you know, just what is this medication, things we talked about earlier. Two, the results of the studies. Uh, and, and three, how to prescribe it. And, and four, very importantly, about breakthrough bleeding. So there's a, there, you know, this is being worked on on a number of fronts. Uh, let's start with the sponsor. So, I mean, Genentech, you know, my opinion, and, you know, they agree, in fact, that they have a responsibility to educate, you know, the, the hemophilia community at large, both, you know, prescribers, physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers, perhaps, and, and patients as well. And, you know, they have embarked on an ambitious educational program with, you know, there's already been a, a live broadcast shortly after the um, launch of the drug. There's been multiple uh, webcasts, webinars. Uh, there's also going to be in-person uh, trainings through various experts from around the country. Um, who will be traveling around giving talks to uh, different treatment centers and different providers. There's also an effort to train, uh, to educate uh, nurses, to educate patients as well. They've also created um, a lot of materials, uh, uh, sort of written materials, brochures, and what have you, uh, to hand out. So, so I think that the the sponsor Genentech is taking resp- taking responsibility for doing a lot of the education, you know, as I think they should. Secondly, however, um, you know, MASAC, uh, so the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council of the National Hemophilia Foundation, has already put out a, a quick statement. Uh, I say quick because it was sort of um, you know, quickly put together shortly after the news of the launch with some general guidance. So there's already a MASAC statement. And then there's going to be a uh, document written by, uh, I'm included in that group, written by those the group that put that together. Um, to publish in a medical journal, um, hopefully early part of next year. Uh, we're already working on that um, to to put out as sort of a guidance document. As okay, you want to prescribe Hemlibra? Here is how. Here are the things you need to consider, including obviously avoiding uh, uh, very much so. Obviously avoiding the um, risk uh, for thrombotic events, of avoiding thrombotic events. Um, so I think you know the the and then you know other societies um, you know I'm involved in the ISTH uh, and so there'll be plenty of education being given there. There's already planned uh, talk on this drug uh, at a symposium at the American Society of Pediatric Hematology Oncology. So I think you know both the community, uh, the academic community, um, is already you know sort of mobilized to do talks at various symposia. The sponsor, as I mentioned, is having a lot of activities with education. Uh, and then, you know, the NHF, via its Medical and Scientific Advisory Council, is putting out uh, documents as well. So I think all of that effort um, is geared towards ensuring that this, you know, very new, different kind of drug is going to be prescribed responsibly, appropriately, and that breakthrough bleeds are managed appropriately so that we get all the efficacy, all the wonderful efficacy that we've seen without any of the um, uh, thrombotic events or any other side effects that we don't want to see. Uh, so then last question about Hemlibra, um, kind of on the flip side or, or on the other side of the educational um, uh, lift that comes with, with the introduction of this product, um, are, are there any particular questions or topics that patients and families who are going to their HTC or going to their hematologist who are impacted by inhibitors and are thinking about Hemlibra have heard something about is ACE 910, ME emicizumab, now Hemlibra. You know, we've covered a lot of ground here, but are there any particular questions or considerations that you would advise patients walking into their to their um, uh, appointment to be thinking about and asking about? Sure. I mean, I think the main questions are, um, you know, is this treatment appropriate for my son? Um, is, you know, do you think this treatment is going to be effective for my son? Uh, and most importantly, um, how are we going to manage, you know, breakthrough bleeds if and when they do happen? How are we going to manage surgeries if they, uh, if and when they happen? And how do we deal with trauma? Um, and I think that that's, I think those are really the, the the main questions, right? Is it appropriate for my son? How do we treat, you know, h- how do we use this medication, and how do we use it safely? Um, and you know, make sure that the physicians. Um, nurse practitioners uh, involved in prescribing it uh, really do spend time educating the family about, you know, what the medicine is, how it works, how it's prescribed, how it's administered, and how breakthrough bleeds are managed. And I think, you know, if all of that is being done 
I think we can have you know really great great results uh, without the concern for the thrombotic events. Well, the concern will be there, but without seeing the thrombotic events. And then uh, other major takeaways from from Ash and some recent um, investigational product development updates that might just be worth um, a, a few minutes of how they may or may not impact the inhibitor community in the near future. So for a while, when we talked about non-factor replacement therapies, it, it felt like emicizumab, now known as Hemlibra, and um, Fetusaran from Alnylam, completely different mechanism of action, but similar in that it is not factor. It is something else being leveraged to behave as 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 factor or to fill in blanks in the clotting cascade, to, to put it in layman's terms. Um, th- we know that that trial was suspended because they too had some issues with th- thrombotic events. Um, but that trial is now resuming. I'm curious to know from your perspective if you think that that product, if things develop, this is speculative, obviously, but if things go well from here, um, do you see anything that is unique in that product that might offer inhibitor patients something that perhaps Hemlibra does not? And then going further, uh, there were also a lot of headlines coming out of ASH because of gene therapy and the data, in particular, Biomarin's data that was presented about gene therapy and the promise that that holds for people with severe hemophilia A. So can you just discuss those two things and how they may or may not impact the inhibitor population in particular in the near and long term? Sure. Um, So Fetuzuran, as you mentioned, is another uh, novel type of product to um, correct the clotting defect in patients with hemophilia. The particularly unique thing about Fetuzuran is that it can be used in hemophilia A and hemophilia B. So importantly, Hemlibra uh, for those of you know, for the listeners out there who have hemophilia B with inhibitors or hemophilia B, you know, even without inhibitors, Hemlibra is not for you. This drug does not uh, has not been tested and likely, with its mechanism of action, will not work in hemophilia B. So, Fetuzuran offers the possibility of working in a similar way, a different mechanism of action, as you said, but but to a similar way in terms of reduction of bleeding in patients with hemophilia B. So, probably the most unique thing about Hemlibra. Uh, sorry, about uh, fetusaran is the potential for patients with hemophilia B with inhibitors. Now, there's not many of those patients out there, but uh, those patients really, uh, really suffer even worse because many of them have allergic reactions to factor IX, which means they cannot use FIBA. Many of them cannot undergo immune tolerance. And so, as a result, they're really stuck using Novo7, which you know may or may not work very well for them. So, I think the most unique thing for me with Fetuzuran is the possibility to also treat hemophilia B patients you know, with and without inhibitors. Um, again, having said that, it can be used in hemophilia A with and without inhibitors as well. So with respect to moving forward, um, you know, Fetuzuran um, you know, with emicizumab already out there, you know, we'll have a bit of a challenge getting hemophilia A patients on. If patients are already doing well with Hemlibra, they may they may not feel like they would want to switch to Fetuzuran, but I think the hemophilia B market is a unique place where Fetuzuran can really, really help out. A couple little other things is one is Hemlibra needs to be refrigerated. Fetuzuran does not. The volume of Hemlibra is a little bit more, is a fair bit more than Fetuzuran. So, you know, injections, you know, larger patients may need, uh, you know, two injections at a time, for example. I think still subcutaneous is such a huge advantage that I think that's a minor point. Uh, but those are a couple little additions, uh, and Fetuzuran would be given once a month. So a smaller injection once a month with a non-refrigerated compound that will come in a pen device, um, that's what Fetuzuran will be, as opposed to Hemlibra, which you know you still have to drop the factor out of a vial of liquid um, and, then in, and then inject it, and the volume is a bit more. Again, it's, I think those are very you know, relatively minor points compared to the mm-hmm. you know, advantage with the efficacy. But th- those, are, those are little... Little subtle differences. I think the main difference is the ability to use it in hemophilia B uh, mm-hmm. patients with and without inhibitors. With respect to gene therapy, if we're talking about the inhibitor community, I think at this point there's really nothing nothing to talk about because those patients are excluded from trials. Actually, even having a history of inhibitor, patients are excluded from those trials. And so I think there's still, you know, I, I mean, I'm excited about the data. I think both for Factor Eight with Biomarin and actually some other companies and, and Spark, which is the one furthest along with their hemophilia B data, although, again, there's other companies working in that area too. I mean, I think that, you know, things are finally really moving in a very good direction, and Phase three trials are going to be starting both for hemophilia A and B. Again, for the inhibitor patients, they're, not, they're going to be excluded. You know, now, whether or not gene therapy could have some sort of tolerizing effect whether or not, you know, in other words, if you give a gene therapy product to somebody with inhibitors, could it make the inhibitor go away? 
is totally speculative at this point. There's no data on that. There's, I mean, even in animals, there's it's questionable. So I think for the inhibitor patients, you know, right now gene therapy is not part of the discussion. Hemlibra is, Fetuzaran is, other drugs that are um, using you know, other types of mechanisms of action are, are there in the future for inhibitor patients. But gene therapy at this point, I don't see that as something that will be of uh, for inhibitor patients, you know, even in the five to eight year time frame. Uh, I mean, once gene therapy is licensed for non-inhibitor patients, certainly it can be looked at. Studies could be evaluated for patients with inhibitors, but uh, that's that's a bit in the offing. That's, that's a pretty important specific talking points there with regard to what Fetusaran can promise for hemophilia B patients with or without inhibitors and how all the excitement about gene therapy does not necessarily translate. If you are a patient with an inhibitor, don't get caught up in all the excitement about that. Get caught up in the excitement about Hemlibra and other things, but not necessarily gene therapy at this point. Um, so last question then for you, Dr. Young, 2018, what will you specifically be keeping an eye out for with regard to advancements in treatment options, um, being able to even further individualize care, anything within the kind of care continuum, care spectrum, what will you be taking a look at specifically in 2018? Yeah, I think, you know, so we're going to see, you know, I believe the widespread use of Hemlibra in inhibitor patients. And I think monitoring the potential for thrombotic events and how it's uh, prescribed and used is going to be very important. The, you know, possible, maybe even probable licensure in non-inhibitor patients is to come um, later in the year, so we can have a real revolutionary change in how even hemophilia A without inhibitors is managed. The Fetuzaran phase three trials are getting going again. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, the, the Hemlibra trials, Haven 1 and 2, enrolled super fast. Uh, I have a feeling that, you know, Fetuzaran can enroll really quickly, and, you know, we may have some really good data on that even by the end of 2018, I hope. Um, and, uh, you know, really then the beginnings of uh, phase three trials in gene therapy. So I think it's a really, really exciting time, both uh, for patients and healthcare professionals in hemophilia. I think for, you know, a while we, we didn't see a lot of innovation, but now we're seeing, you know, tremendous ra and rapid innovation. And it's actually, you know, beginning in 2018, patients are going to have access to a new drug. And I think in 2019, perhaps another new drug. And so things are really, I think, looking up. Uh, for the hemophilia community. And finally, I can say for both non-inhibitor patients and inhibitor patients. And so I'm very excited about that professionally. I'm very excited about that for my patients and looking forward to more of that in the future. Dr. Young, thank you for everything that you do for our community. And thanks for shining a light on what it means to be an inhibitor patient in the U.S. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you again, Dr. Guy Young, for protecting the time to share those insights with us here on the Ask the Expert podcast. I hope you all listening found the conversation informative as we march forward in this ever-changing treatment landscape in hemophilia and von Willebrand disease. There was a lot of dense information presented in this episode, so if you'd like to go and review anything that Dr. Young stated, of course, you can hit rewind and listen to the interview again, or, and or, you can find the transcript of episode 11 of the interview on the episode page at Bloodstream Expert. Dot com. You'll also find a link to the transcript in the program notes of your podcast player. That will also bring you directly to the transcript on bloodstreamexpert.com. And that is all for episode 11 of the Ask the Expert podcast series. We'll be back next month with another expert interview. Bloodstreammedia.com is your one-stop shop for all of Bloodstream Media's podcasts for the bleeding disorders community. Once on Bloodstreammedia.com, don't forget to follow the links and subscribe to the Bloodstream podcast, the Ask the Expert podcast, the Powering Through podcast, and the Bloodline podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Have an idea for a future episode of the Ask the Expert podcast? Have a question that you would like to hear an expert answer? Email us, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You'll also find Bloodstream Media on facebook.com backslash bloodstream media and on Twitter at bloodstream info. This episode of Ask the Expert was written by Patrick James Lynch, produced by Patrick James Lynch, Rob Bradford, Andrew Gall, Josh Bragg, Ava Friedman, and Colby Crow. Artwork by Ryan Gielen and Katie Wright Mead. And special thanks to guest Dr. Guy Young. Check back with us on February 26th for the first episode of the Ask the Expert podcast with host Chris Bombardier. And for one last time here on the Ask the Expert podcast, I'm your host, Patrick James Lynch. And until we speak again, take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody.